scripture reading this morning is from Mark, the 12th chapter, and it's where the authorities are trying to confront and trap Jesus. And so we'll begin in the 13th verse. Mark 12, 13. Then they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to him in order to trap him in a statement. They came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay, tri- to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarii to look at. They brought one, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is on this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were amazed at him. What's the difference between death and taxes? Congress doesn't meet every year to make death worse. (laughs) There's two things they say you're not supposed to talk about, religion and politics. Today, we're going to talk about religion and politics together. Um, uh, You may have noticed that politics is not something that I talk about very much. Um, You have never and will never hear me ever endorse a candidate from the pulpit because that is not my job. My job is to teach the Bible. Whatever the Bible says is what we're going to talk about. Um, And it is pretty timely because we've got an election coming up in four weeks. Um, And in this passage, uh, Jesus is confronted with a very political issue. Um, so we're going to talk about the issue that Jesus is, is facing here, and then uh, we're going to look at some principles that we as Christians can take to learn how to view politics. Um, and if you want to just like fall asleep for the rest of the sermon, here's the short version, that we must view our politics through the lens of our faith. All right, that's, that's the spoiler. That's, that's where we're going to come around to. Um, Mark chapter 12 is all really one long series of conversations dealing around the same thing. When Jesus walks into the temple, he was confronted by the Sanhedrin. These are the rulers that sat on the Jewish high court, uh, made up of, of a couple different kind of political factions, very much how like our Congress does today. But they all came together and confronted Jesus on his authority, right? By what authority do you teach these things? And Jesus says, if you answer my question, I'll answer yours. And they wouldn't answer his question, so he didn't answer theirs. And then Jesus turns around that we were last week, and he confronts them by telling a parable directly about them to their faces, which basically says that God is going to judge you for your wickedness in failing to take care of his people the way that you should have. So now, um, the rest of chapter 12 is a series of three conversations of three different groups of people that the Sanhedrin sends to Jesus, in or- all with the same purpose, to trap him, to try to get him to say something that they can use against him in court. Uh, and so today is the first of those conver- we're going to look at one of those conversations and over the next two weeks right so these these are all connected they all serve the same purpose but jesus is going to be confronted with several different issues and these issues are going to come kind of rapid fire um like if you ever watched that that old clip of muhammad ali in well one of the boxing matches he was in where he's like stuck up against the ropes and these guys just keep throwing blow after blow after blow. And he's just like dodging them like this. And they can't land a single punch. That's what Jesus is doing to each one of these questions. 
Every time they think, ha, we finally got him, and Jesus finds a way around them and just defeats the whole purpose of what they're trying to do, of get him to say something that they can use against him. So let's uh, jump back and let's go verse by verse through what we just read, starting Mark chapter 12, verse 13. Uh, they sent some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. That word sent is important. Uh, that's, the, that's the same word that we get the word apostles from. It means to, to send someone out with authority, almost as an ambassador. Just as Jesus sent out the twelve with his authority to teach and to heal and to cast out demons, the Sanhedrin are sending these people to Jesus on behalf of of them and so they send two groups of people we have the pharisees and the herodians if you followed this series at all you should be pretty familiar with the pharisees these were the kind of ultra conservative legalists um and especially in regards to this conversation the pharisees were very prideful and very nationalistic they resisted any influence politically or theologically that the Romans, or culturally that the Romans might have on their country, and they wanted their own separate country where they could just follow God's law, even though they had a very skewed view of what God's laws were. Now, on the other hand, we also have the Herodians. This is a group that we do not see nearly as much. We only, one other story in the Bible mentions them, and that was pretty early on in the Gospel of Mark. And we don't know a ton about them from history, except that they were the supporters of Herod. Now, remember, Herod the Great is the one that we read about at Christmas time who wanted to kill all the babies because he heard that the king of the Jews were born. And the reason for that is that Herod was essentially a puppet king. He was given the title king over the Jews by the Romans. He was not actually Jewish, although he converted to Judaism when he became king in order to appease some of the some of the Jews. He's like, look, I'm like one of you, but he really wasn't. Um, and then after he died, his son Herod Antipas was named governor over the northern region of Israel. Um, and again, was very much a, a he was a Roman puppet. Um, he did not serve the interests of the Jewish people. He served the interests of Rome. Rome said, jump. Herod said, hi. It was Herod that had John the Baptist beheaded because he confronted him about his sin with leaving his wife for another woman. And so uh, we have two very opposing groups. The, the Pharisees hated the Romans and the Herodians loved the Romans. They're like, look at these roads. Aren't these pretty great? And the Pharisees are like, no, they're a bunch of devil worshipers, right? Two people that do not get along. And yet what we have in this story is an example of the old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Apparently the only thing that these two groups hated more than each other was Jesus. And so two very opposing groups coming united to confront Jesus. Verse 14, and they came and said to him, teacher, We know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearance, but truly teach the way of God. All of this is completely true. Jesus teaches what his father gave him. He doesn't care about popular opinion. He doesn't care about offending people. He speaks the truth, but he does it in love. And so they're right in saying all of these things, but they don't mean any of it. All they're doing is buttering him up, right? They're, they're giving him compliments to build him up just so they can knock it down, right? They're trying to, trying to soften what they're about to say. Because they go on and say, and here's, here's the actual question that they ask him. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? So the specific tax that they're referring to here is what's known as the poll tax, where um, every person in the Roman Empire had to pay one denarius per year, right? So every person was obligated to pay this. A denarius is one day's worth of wages for the common laborer. It It was a single coin that you get for one day 
of working. So the money's not really the issue here, right? That's, it's, it's actually a pretty small, insignificant tax. We'll talk more about why it was an issue in just a moment. But when we look at who's asking this, again, the Roman, or sorry, the, the Pharisees hated the Romans. So they thought, they, they did not think that they should have to pay this tax to Caesar. But the Herodians were like, I mean, look at all the Romans have done for us, right? Everything's peaceful. They've, they've given us some nice roads. We've got clean water. Of course they deserve the money. Pay the tax, right? And so right, each, each one of these people that are asking the question are hoping for a different answer. But there's even more at stake there as well because most of Jesus' followers, right, the average citizen within Israel is going to lean more towards the side of the Pharisees, which, me which means that if they get Jesus say, to say, yes, pay your tax, then he's going to upset a large part of his base. They're trying to get, they're trying to get the people to turn against Jesus because he's become so popular. So they're hoping that if he says, yes, pay your taxes, then all of these people will get upset and stop following him. Now, on the flip side, if he says, no, don't pay your taxes, now they have something that they can literally arrest him and bring him in, right, to, to court in front of the Romans and say, see, this man's trying to incite some kind of political revolution, and he's telling people not to pay taxes and to rebel against Rome. And so it's kind of a lose-lose situation. If he takes one, he's going to upset. The, if, he, if he tells them to pay their taxes, he upsets the Jews. If he tells them not to pay their taxes, he upsets the Romans. And so look at how Jesus answers, verse 15. But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Right? He calls them out on, on their intentions. He says, bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Tim, if you can go to the, the next slide. I have a picture of the denarius here for you. Um, right, so it's, it's telling that Jesus did not actually have one of these coins on him because he was very poor and his entire ministry was based on the generosity of other people. He didn't carry or handle money himself hardly at all. Um, so the picture on there is Tiberius Caesar. He is the third emperor of Rome after Julius Caesar and then Augustus Caesar. And then one of the things that the Roman emperors did quite often is that if they didn't have a son or if they didn't trust one of their own sons to take over the empire, they would actually adopt a young man that they thought was promising. Like, they would basically handpick their successor and then adopt them as their child so that they could pass it down through, like, the family line. And so Tiberius was adopted by Augustus. And, uh, and so that is, that is the face of Tiberius. It was said as he got older, um, he actually, like, started losing his hair and had, like, herpes on his face and uh, became so ugly and was so, like, self-conscious of it that for the last several years of his reign, he actually, like, left Rome and, like, went into hiding because he was too embarrassed to come into public. Like, history's weird. <laughs> uh, but so the inscription that you see on there is um, it's Latin for Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. And then on the back side, you'll see the words Pontifus Maximus, which is Latin for high priest. Um, in Rome, they had something known as the Roman imperial cult. This was an official Roman religion that taught that when a Caesar or an emperor died, if he, did, if he ruled well, then he would become a god. And so Tiberius's adopted father, Augustus, the Romans believed that upon his death, he was glorified and took his place among the other gods in the pantheon. And Tiberius being, although he didn't actually, he started off really well and people liked him because he was a good administrator, um, but kind of went crazy towards the end of his life. So he never got that distinction. But being the emperor, he was the de facto high priest of this official religion in Rome. 
And so for the Jews, this is not merely, right, taxation without representation, that kind of thing. They believed that paying this tax was literally giving a tribute to a false god. Right? For them, this represented a form of idolatry, which makes this whole question even more important. Um, right? like when, you, when you understand that, you start to have more sympathy towards the side of the Pharisees and be like, yeah, I don't think I want to pay that tax either. And so this is what Jesus is caught up in. This is the, the cultural situation that they find themselves in. And so Jesus, right, he says, whose likeness is on it? And they pull out one of these very coins and say, it's Caesar's. And Jesus said to them in verse 17, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. So once again, they set a trap. And once again, Jesus is able to just sidestep the whole thing. and Like, we thought we had him. How did we not get him? And so the application of this, uh, the, the short version of the application is pretty simple. You have to pay taxes. Um, I remember uh, several years ago, there was this kind of famous Christian teacher who was arrested for tax evasion and went to jail for nine years. And I'm like, it's, it's literally in the Bible several times that regardless of what you think about the government, you have to pay taxes. Now, the longer version of this is... Um, a little bit more complicated, but very important that we understand. Because when Jesus tells them to pay their taxes, he's citing a very important principle. And look at how he responds. He says, Give, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And the principle here is that there are two kingdoms. There is the earthly kingdom, and then there is the heavenly kingdom. Um, St. Augustine in like the 400s wrote a book called The Kingdom of God where he, his, he phrased it as there's the, the kingdom of man and there's the kingdom of God. And so the age-old question is how as Christians are we supposed to balance these two things? How are we supposed to be both citizens of America and citizens of heaven? Um, and so I've got three points here for us to kind of just think through this. Again, this is, I said we're going to talk about politics. Um, I'm not going to get like too in-depth in any one thing. But here are some, some biblical principles. This is the framework on how we should think about our politics. So point number one, we are citizens of heaven first. Right? That is our first priority. That one must come first. Uh, we have to realize that it doesn't matter who our next president is, whether it's Kamala Harris or Donald Trump. Neither one of them are going to fix your life. Neither one of them have the power to forgive you of your sins. And no matter what you're looking for in a candidate, there is no greater need that you have than to be reconciled with your Heavenly Father. And the only one that can do that is King Jesus. Regardless of whoever the president is, we must never lose sight that Jesus is our king first. Before we are Americans, we are Christians. Right? We have to get that priority right. Which means that we must learn to filter our politics through our faith. That the word of God is the, the, the standard by which everything else that we are going to say or believe must, must come through this. Way too many Christians get that backwards. We need to prioritize theology over ideology. Um, which means that we need to be reading our Bibles a lot more than we're watching the news. If I were to scroll through all of your social media... Or if you don't have social media, if I were to come and sit down at the table next to you on Saturday morning at the diner when you're having coffee with all of your friends and listen in on all of your conversations, what would I learn more about? Your faith or your political views? Which do you spend more time telling, trying to persuade other people about? If we're really honest, we probably talk more about our politics than we do our faith. That's wrong, 
We should, right, our primary purpose is not to get people to vote the same way that we do. Our primary people purpose is to get other people to love and to trust in Jesus for their eternity, right? That has to come first. We must learn to get our priorities straight, which means that our testimony and our witness as Christians should be more important to us than who we vote for. The second point that we need to realize is that governments are put in place by God. I'm going to take you to Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities and resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Verse 6 says, For because of this, you also pay taxes. We're back to that again. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect it is owed. And honor to whom honor is owed. Right. God created governments. God anoints kings and rulers. Right. We live in a representative republic. We have the ability to vote for who's in charge, kind of, but I'm not going there. Uh, right. But ultimately, regardless of what we vote for, it is God who appoints rulers. And because of that, we are obligated to show them honor and respect. And you may be thinking, yeah, but, but our rulers don't deserve respect. Look at, like, Jesus said this, who's going to be executed by the Romans. Paul, who's going to be executed by the Romans. Um, Peter recites this in Second Peter who's going to be executed by the Romans. Daniel, who uh, was thrown into a lion's den by his rulers, cites this same thing. Right, all throughout history, we have a long history of really bad rulers. This is not some unique moment in history that we're in. We're, this is actually pretty standard when you, look when, you, when you look back at what's happened over the last several thousands of years. But here's the thing. We don't honor our leaders because of the person we honor the position. The best example of this in Scripture is David. When God had told him, had anointed him to become the next king of Israel, but yet Saul was still serving as king. And Saul got furious with David and was hunting him and trying to kill him. And David was forced to flee into the mountains and he was hiding in a cave. When one day Saul walks into that very cave and he has the opportunity to assassinate him. Right? And then he can become king. Everything he's ever wanted. But David says, right, I could never harm the Lord's anointed. The man who's actively trying to kill him. He refused to lay a finger on. Why? Because David respected the position. Because God has appointed him as king. And therefore he refused to touch him. Right? And so we must have honor and respect for our political leaders. Even if you disagree with them. Right? That doesn't mean that we're never allowed to criticize our leaders or to point out what they're doing wrong. What it does mean is that if we're going to criticize them, we must do it in an honorable way. Right? So if you're going to point out something that our government is doing wrong, I want you to point to the policy or the action, not just hurling personal insults at people. That fixes nothing. And right, the, the way that we honor the people that are in authority over us is actually, it actually demonstrates the way in which we honor God. Whether you like it or not, Joe Biden is our president and he was placed there by God. Again, I can find a lot of things wrong with his policies, but we need to honor him because he's in that position. And whether it's Donald Trump or Kamala Harris, we need to honor the position because that position is put there by God. And the last thing that we need to realize is this home is temporary, but we still need to make 
the best of it. Um, I want to take you to Jeremiah chapter 19. Um, in this chapter, God is speaking through the prophet Jeremiah to the, to the people of Jerusalem who have just been carried off from their home, exiled from their home, and forced to live in Babylon. And he's basically telling them, he's like, you're not going anywhere for a while. For 70 years, you are going to be here before I will let you come home. And then he says in uh, Jeremiah 19, 17, he says, But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. And then he goes on to tell them to build houses, plant gardens, take wives, take wives for your sons. He's saying, get comfortable because you're going to be here for a while. And while you're here, I want you to make the best of this. I want you to be the light into this very dark place. And I want you to help this to become a more godly place. I hate to break it to you. America is not the promised land. America is Babylon. This is our home. And it is our responsibility as Christians to make this a better place. It is our responsibility to get involved to, er, in, in our communities, to, to be a light to the world. And we live at a very beautiful time in the world where we live in a constitutional republic where we get to vote and elect the leaders that rule over us. So it is your obligation as a Christian to not only go vote, but to educate yourself first in what does the Bible say about many of these issues. And then second, which one of these candidates best aligns with what the Bible says? Some, some Christians have this idea like, oh, well, right, we shouldn't get involved in politics. That's their thing, right? And people are like, oh, separation of church and state. Can you tell me where in our founding documents the word separation of church and state ha occurs? It doesn't. The first place it comes was in a letter written by Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptist Convention in Virginia, I think. Don't quote me on that part. Uh, but basically, there were a group of pastors that said, right, because they came, right, a lot of them came out of, like, the Church of England, where the government literally controlled the church. And so they're like, so how does, how does this work? And, and he told them, like, no, there is a separation between church and state, which in its original context, what it meant is that the government does not get a say in how we run our churches, that we are free to worship the way that we see fit, and they do not get to tell us how we can and cannot worship. That's what the separation of church and state means. It does not mean that we are not allowed to try to make laws that follow God's word. Right? People are like, oh, you're just like preaching. Guess what? The other side's preaching too. They have their religion with their sacrifices and all that stuff, and they are trying to thrust that upon us. And if we sit back and say, well, I don't want to get involved. I'm not going to go out and vote. Oh, it's the lesser of two of evils. I'm not choosing between that. When good people do nothing, evil prevails. If we don't go out and vote for the people that are making policies that reflect God's word, then the only people left to vote are the ones that hate God's word and that want to make policies that will actively destroy everything, the, the, the moral foundation that this country was founded upon. Right? And so I, right, it is our responsibility to know what does the Bible say and how are we supposed to live this out in our lives and how should governments function according to God's word, right? And I just, I can't conceive in my mind how anybody who claims to be a follower of Jesus could vote for a candidate that thinks that it is acceptable to mutilate unborn babies and to castrate our children and allow them to change their sex. I said I wouldn't tell you who to vote for. I didn't say I wouldn't tell you who not to vote for, okay? There's a difference there. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so th wrap all this up. Again, we are citizens of heaven first, which means that you should go out and vote in November. But more importantly, that we should be a witness and a testimony to the people around us, right? That, that we should be shaped by God's word. 
We cannot let our politics shape our faith. It has to be the other way around. Our faith comes first, and that influences how we're supposed to live our lives. And when we can do that, the entire world will flourish more, right? When people live according to God, the principles that are found in God's word, human life flourishes, that our lives will become better. But also keep in mind that our goal is not to make people's trip to hell more comfortable. Our goal is ultimately to save people from their sins by pointing them to Jesus, and that has to come first. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word and this example that you have given us. And as we, we, we can see our culture, uh, although we've never been perfect, we're certainly drifting further and further away from your word. Um, the good news is, is that the Bible is full of pictures of what faithfulness and godliness looks like when the world around us is falling apart. Um, we pray for our country. We pray for our leaders. We pray for, for Joe Biden. We pray for, for every person that is in authority over us, um, not just because we elected them, but because you allowed them to be appointed to that position and that you are sovereign over everything, that you will hold them accountable for the decisions that they make when we are in office. And that takes the pressure off of us because it's not our job to, to, to do that because ultimately you will. But I also pray that we will get out and vote for the, the people, not just what's best for our country, but what is best for, for you. Like that the people that closely align themselves with your word. I pray that we would become known more for our faith than for our politics that we'd, we would prioritize bringing people to you instead of just getting people to vote in the way that we want. As, as, as important as that is, help us to always keep our priorities straight and that everything that we do needs to be centered around the gospel. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.